All right. Okay, we begin chapter 28 of baptism. Uh, yeah, I know most of you are Baptist. No? So I may, you may uh, disagree with this, but uh, I want you to know under what reasons or under what biblical support uh, the uh, uh, other people, uh, we call that, you know, a pseudo Baptist uh, are based on, okay? Section one, oh, is a sacrament inauguration. So there's immediately a distinction between baptism and Lord's Supper. Baptism is a sacrament in the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant grace of his engrafting into Christ, regeneration of remission of sins and of his giving up unto God. Though Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life, which sacrament is by Christ's own appoint, appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. All right. Uh, that implies the once for allness of baptism in distinction from the repeatability of the Lord's Supper. Yeah, so there, the, the, there's a difference between Lord's Supper and uh, baptism. Baptism is just a once, so, once for all act. It's just a we do once in our lifetime, but the Lord's Supper, we do it regularly, all right? to be continued in this in his church until the end of the world. Uh, rooted in great commission, but also partly nuanced against the teaching of the Quakers. Yeah, uh, Richard just mentioned the Quakers because they emphasize more on the work of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they are, uh, allege or they theorize that the baptism of the Holy Spirit replaced uh, the water baptism. Okay, that baptism was a physical administration that was intended only for a brief period in the life of the Christian church. So it's an inaugural sacrament. It is the sign and seal of membership in covenant community, and it is perpetual. Uh, okay, section two, the details of what this means. The outward element to be used in this sacrament is water, wherewith the party is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of Ghost by a minister of the gospel lawfully called thereunto. And the mode of baptism is how you baptize with water, a dipping, immersion of the person into the water is not uh, unnecessary. You know, uh, we say that, of course, it, it's good. You know, if uh, the waters are plenty and available, we may do that. But more important thing is the mode is not that important. But baptism is also rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. I don't have to go through all this. If you have read Robosio's commentary, you know, he narrates many, many reasons that the, uh, why uh, the uh, main uh, churches, including Roman Catholic, Presbyterians, 
a Lutherans or a Church of England or you know Methodists, they all uh, does uh, like sprinkling or pouring, not uh, dipping. You know, hidden behind this is a particular debate as to the precise wording. You would think at first sight that the divines were saying dipping is the real way, but it is necessary. But in fact, it's intended to express the notion that the majority of divines believe the sprinkling or pouring was the uh, a method. Section four brings us beyond the mode of administration. But this is what? Then section three was about mode of baptism. Now it's a subject of baptism who are to receive a baptism. Baptist, the only adult who can profess, you know, confess their uh, 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 belief. But the pseudo Baptists, they say, not only those that do actually profess faith in and obedience unto Christ, but also the infants of one or both believing parents are to be baptized. Like I said, you know, I, I will omit all this explanation, which was already in detail explained by Robert Shaw. Okay. The fundamental grounds on which they believe that infant baptism was correct. The covenant with Abraham was ongoing, therefore, its principles must also be ongoing. The fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant would conform rather than repudiate the principle of the Abrahamic, that the promise given was to you and your seed. They believe that Paul is teaching in Colossians 2 uh, that baptism takes the place of circumcision. Circumcision was administered to infants and therefore, unless there was specific denial of the principle, then the principle of application to you and to your seed would apply to baptism also. Rather than find the repudiation of that principle to you and your seed, including children, which was present in all previous covenants was conformed in the first promulgation of the new covenant in Christ in Acts 2.38 and 39, uh, where uh, Peter uh, preached. And this all gospel is to you and to your uh, a seed, to your descendants, to your children. They believe that this formed the background to the idea of children being holy in 1 Corinthians chapter 17, verse 14. The holiness of the new must be rooted in covenantal dynamic. And if rooted in covenantal dynamic, that would conform the principle that covenant was administered to believers and their seed. As they took all these two Jesus words in the gospel, they believed it was conformed. By the way, Jesus received infants in the gospel and described them as those of the kingdom of God. Okay, at this point, uh, I'm going to... use this chart in order for you to understand uh, their position uh, in an easier way. This is the uh, uh, covenant. Uh, look at this, you know, Abraham right here. Okay. Mm. When God made a uh, covenant with Abraham, you know, in chapter 15, God made a uh, God made a covenant with Abraham. God promised Abraham. 
And then chapter 17, God gave the ordinance of circumcision, Abraham and to his children. Okay. And look at this. And then also God gave ordinance of uh, uh, Passover to Moses after their exodus. And according to covenant theology, these two ordinances, one is circumcision and the other one's law, uh, 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 Passover, were carried over into New Testament period because this, you know, in essence, both of them are covenant of grace. They're both of them are signs and seers of Jesus Christ, particularly his death and resurrection. Yeah, so a circumcision was done not only to Abraham, who confessed his uh, a belief, but also to his seed, children. Same thing on that same principle apply here. So when I become Christian, then I have a, 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 a children, then they are the ones to receive on the same uh, theology of covenant of grace. What is this covenant concept? It is individual? Yes, it is individual, but also corporate. You remember, I always emphasize when God made covenant with Adam, Adam stood uh, before God, not only individually, but as a representative, as a head of all human beings. That is the main concept of the uh, covenant, not only individual, but also a corporate. Same thing, that is why we include our children in the covenant of family or covenant uh, community. Okay. Uh, this is the nutshell, you know, the, uh, uh, so if we believe a covenant of theology consistently apply, then yeah, we come to a pseudo baptism. That is what I'm going to share with you so that you may disagree, but you have an easier understanding of their positions. Uh, you know, since when you, when you, uh, when you study uh, church history, actually, uh, the Baptist uh, theology, as far as a baptism is concerned, they really was in a full swing, only the time of reformation. Before that, almost 1400 years or 1300 years, it was, you know, no baptism, uh, no uh, 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 baptismal principle really exercised by church because that's it. As we all know, it's just the Roman a Catholic Church. Uh, there was a, a Catholic Church and also Orthodox Church, but both of them, you know, exercised this uh, 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 a pseudo baptismic uh, practice. But when Reformation uh, took place, at the time there was a movement named Anabaptist, very radical, very uh, gospel oriented. You know, they didn't want to have anything to do with this old uh, tradition of Roman Catholic Church. And at that time, uh, this uh, a sect or this group, you know, we call them Anabaptists. Uh, they pro primarily arose in Netherlands and in Germany and later on in England, okay? Yeah, those people really, uh, brought the Bible and see, you know, began to argue with the uh, uh, main churches. 
Lutherans and uh, Reform, insisting that they were the truly biblical one. You know, so Anabaptist means uh, rebaptize. So they, you know, of course they they were all pseudo Baptist. Pseudo Bapt, you know, they were young. They were baptized, but they rebaptized again themselves. You know, so that movement really has suffered. But as you well know. Uh, during Reformation time, the Anabaptists were severely persecuted by these uh, Lutherans and uh, not to mention Roman Catholic Church. You know, they, of course, persecuted, you know, all uh, uh, Protestants. But even among Protestants, uh, the uh, Baptists were uh, persecuted by Lutherans, uh, Church of England, and uh, uh, a reformed people. Yeah, but uh, actually, uh, it is only 100 years later. 100 years? Yeah, 100 years later, in 1916, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1600s, you know, the uh, uh, Baptist, uh, Baptist uh, uh, movement really. Uh, uh, attracted, you know, uh, theological attention from uh, mainline uh, denominations in England. Yeah, and then because of, uh, yeah, and then the, uh, because they were persecuted in Britain and European continent, many of them emigrated to the America. And see, America uh, was the land uh, where the, you know, this Baptist movement really uh, uh, grew. So now, oh, probably you see, uh, in, in, in the United States, the largest denomination is the Baptist, particularly, thank God, you know, all other denominations uh, controlled by uh, liberal uh, wings, liberal theologians, liberal uh, seminaries, thank God, only Baptist. You know, the Southern Baptist Con Convention, uh, probably you're very familiar with, they are the largest denominations and Baptist denominations. You know, they control, they're conservative and they control the Baptist uh, 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 denomination. Uh, so like American uh, Baptist or other Baptists, you know, more liberal, and they are kind of minors, right? That is just, a, we just briefly uh, uh, review uh, the development of uh, uh, Baptist, uh, Baptist. All right. Uh, you know, what I want to share is it is, it is not you know, useful to engage in who, what is right and what is wrong because it's been going on already uh, several hundred years. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, uh, my position is, of course, you know, I'm a pseudo Baptist, but uh, I love our Baptist brothers and sisters. We are all you know, believe in Jesus, that is what counts most. So in, for example, mission field, you know, where all different kinds of uh, denominational missionaries get together and what kind of mood, you know, when you do baptize, then what do you have to do when you work together you know, as a whole uh, uh, mission group? Yeah, then in those kind of cases, you need a lot of wisdom, you know, and, uh, uh, associate, okay? and then uh, 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 you 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 perform this uh, uh, ceremony. Okay. In either way, it has nothing to do with uh, real salvation, you know, regeneration. If you're not, uh, for example, Roman Catholic or even some sect of uh, Lutherans who emphasize on baptismal regeneration. That means when you're baptized, you're really regenerated. So 
you know, without a baptism, you cannot be saved, but we do not believe that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, as long as we uh, follow this in principle, then I don't think uh, the matters uh, are very uh, uh, different because ultimately, you know, for example, Baptists who uh, emphasize on public confession you know, of their faith, that not all Baptists are truly uh, born again Christian either. If you have a if you have a role number, for example, your church membership uh, 100, but true believers 100 in uh, Baptist church, but the people who come regularly, maybe 20. Then what about the rest, the 80 people who truly confessed and never you know, attending a church on a regular basis? The same thing, yeah, we, we can have a, a, a thousand different reasons against the other position. So I guess, you know, but it is good for us to know the opposite view, why, you know, opposite view is so prevalent and they st still think, you know, their position is very biblical. And not only this issue, but many other issues, you know, that's why uh, for us to uh, 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 concentrate on major doctrines where, you know, uh, uh, the, you go specifically in detail, then not even uh, two uh, 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 Christians on the, uh, uh, in the world who can have exactly the same opinions or same belief in everything, you know, that are taught in the Bible. No, because God made us all differently. You know, our understanding should be different too. Not 100% same. We are not, you know, a communist or we are not, you know, uh, 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 compared to express our faith compulsorily. No, that's not true of faith. Yeah, so we have all this uh, maneuvering room uh, about the uh, important doctrine. And I guess this is uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, area where we can defer and steer. Uh, we can work together and believe together. Okay, uh, let's put it that way. Section five, although it be a great sin to contempt or neglect this ordinance, yet grace and salvation are not so inseparably annexed unto it, as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it. Like, you know, again, I said, you know, baptismal uh, regeneration, all that, all that are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated, whether, you know, pseudo-Baptist churches or even Baptist churches, uh, there are a bunch of people who are not born again Christians. So this is what, you know, uh, it uh, addressed those problems. Emphasize the importance, necessity of uh, baptism, yet carefully underlining that the necessity of baptism is not the necessity of means to justification, but the necessity of the obligation of discipleship. Again, they want to point out that the grace that is wanting to be expressed by baptism is not located within baptism or inseparably annexed to baptism. The rite of baptism as such is symbolic. The effect of that baptism is dependent on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is important, but not uh, as uh, a Quakers, you know, insist. This is not the whole, you know, we accept the necessity of baptism. Uh, is dependent on the ministry of the Holy Spirit 
as faith is. So grace and salvation are not hidden within the elements of baptism. But then they add in section six, the efficacy of baptism is not tied to the moment of time wherein it is administered. Yet, notwithstanding, by the right use of these ordinances, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whether of age or infants, as that grace belong unto, according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. Yeah, this is very important. You know, when uh, it is effective only when this uh, rite is performed, then what? Then it has nothing to do with us now that it's, it's all past. But it doesn't mean that. It means whenever we, we uh, meditate upon uh, a baptism, and also when other people you know, are baptized, we attend there and then we share this amazing blessing benefits together. And whenever, you know, probably you're familiar with this story, uh, when Martin Luther, you know, when he was uh, struggling uh, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the conflict with the conflict against Roman Catholic Church, whenever he was depressed or down, the, he always talked to himself. Yeah, I'm a baptized person. I'm a baptized person, you know? That's just one expression. What does that mean? That he participated in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is the outward sign manifestation of his fellowship with the living Jesus that really strengthened his faith. You know, whenever he was down or depressed, he repeated himself, you know, that I'm that baptized person, right? So they're saying that baptism portrays to us the grace of the gospel, which is received by faith. But the grace is not so enshrined in the elements of baptism that it operates in an ex opera operato, that is automatically. That just by administering it, regeneration is effective. That's again, you know, baptismal regeneration. By the same token, because baptism is the symbol and not itself the regeneration, its value stretches far beyond the moment in which it was administered. Indeed, the way in which baptism is used in the New Testament time, New Testament underlies this, that the whole of the Christian life is to be a drawing of the significance of baptism. So much so that the efficacy of my baptism becomes a lifelong thing in the way in which seeing my baptism as a mirror of what Christ has done for me and calls me to who I am called and respond for the whole of my life to live the baptized life. Yes, yeah, so we are to live our baptized life for the rest of our life, always continuously remind ourselves of the fact that we were engrafted into Jesus Christ through baptism. That was the beginning. And that efficacy is still going strong on and on until we die, all right? I'm no longer what I was by nature. As I receive by faith the forgiveness and new life that is emblemized to me in baptism, I recognize my new identity. 
it is as if, you know, I said, I am God's child. I'm God's son, no matter what, you know, always try to convince me that I belong to God. The same thing, same efficacy. And it's the recognition of my new identity that makes look at my situation in a different way. The recognition that in union with Christ, I've been delivered from union with sin. And it is this that is emblemized to me in baptism that enables me to stand up straight and to live in the light of the fact that I'm no longer under the dominion of sin, but I've been brought into the dominion of grace. Now, don't forget this. This is important. I'm no longer under the dominion of sin. Now, don't be confused between justification and sanctification. When we are, the moment we are justified, that means we are no longer under the dominion of sin. That means sin no longer has upper hand when we struggle with sin. But in sanctification, we may lose this picture a, a better from time to time because of our sinful nature. But what? So the influence of sin is what? Continue until we die physically. But the dominion of sin is just finished the moment we believe in Jesus and be saved, okay? That is the difference between uh, justification and sanctification. But both of which come from what? The participation in the death and resurrection in repentance and faith, okay? So far then, and this is a significant thing, both with respect to baptism and the Lord's Supper, the power of baptism is not dissipated 10 minutes after the baptism. It lasts forever, as long as I live on this side of the world. Indeed, it may be a blessed experience at the time, but what's important is does the efficacy of what is administered keep coming back to you every day, every, every week, every month? Okay. Finally, section seven regarding baptism. The sacrament of baptism is but once to be administered unto any person. This is rooted in their understanding of the principle that baptism is the inaugural, inaugural principle that opens up symbolically to our once and for all union with Jesus Christ. And in that sense, there is a nuance of significance about baptism that differentiates the significance of baptism from the significance of the Lord's Supper, although both point to the same Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Up to this point, uh, is there any question uh, regarding baptism? So clarifications from here, I don't understand the uh, here, just above here. The power yeah. of baptism isn't dissipated 10 minutes oh, after oh, the baptism. Oh, okay, right here, okay. Let's read again. So far then, and this is a significant thing, both with respect to baptism and Lord's Supper. The power of baptism is not dissipated 10 minutes after the baptism. You know, when at the time of being baptized, 
the power, spiritual power or spiritual benefit you have received. No, it will continue after the ceremony or rite of baptism or after you attend the, you know, a baptism ceremony, still the significance, uh, the, the efficacy will continue, not just disappear with the ceremony. Okay. Yeah, so it's just it's the same as a Lord Supper. You know, the Lord Supper, you receive special uh, grace, a special uh, a benefit. But whenever you think about the Lord's Supper, and remember, that's when the ethical still continue. This is the meaning, you know. Dissipate it, disappear. It's, yeah, ten minutes. No, no, it doesn't uh, uh, work that way. Okay, it's not. Yeah, the one, sir. Uh, can you tell me a uh, um, little uh, a bit about mm -hmm. uh, baptism uh, mm -hmm. positions between reform theologies and uh, Baptist church? Uh, because I yeah, uh, for me I cannot distinguish uh, when okay. I even I read the yes, Westminster Confessions faith. Uh, well, it's uh, when they are defining the, okay. the, the, the baptism, it's, uh, it, it's uh, hard, hard to digest. All right. Therefore, uh, That's a good question. Uh, simple. Right. Yes. Yeah, the big difference is just this. Uh, let me see. Uh, what is this? Not this, sorry. See, as far as the baptism is concerned, the Baptist position is the difference is here. There's no continuance in this sacrament because this is new age. Yeah, the Baptist position was in the Old Testament. For example, the Abrahamic uh, covenant, that is circumcision, and a covenant of circumcision was external manifestation. Yes. Now yes. we come into the really spiritual age. The substance is main thing. And baptism is not the sign and seal of the covenant, but baptism is the what? Baptism is the proof that you participate in death and resurrection of Jesus Christ through your faith. But you know, evidently the children. The infants cannot profess their faith because they are not able. That's why uh, the Baptists say the accountability age. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I'll just make it very easy, all right? Just the very basic ones. This is the uh, uh, dividing line according to Baptist, you know? So they do not agree that this Old Testament uh, sacrament, that is what? Two kinds, one is circumcision and the other one is a, a Lord's Supper. These belong to all dispensation. They are not equivalent to New Testament a baptism and Lord's Supper. But this covenant theology or reformed or you know, all these uh, main denominations, including Roman Catholic, they say these are signs and seers. For example, what? 
What about the circumcision? Circumcision was the a sign and seal of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. That's why, you know, uh, the Abraham believed and he was saved, and Moses believed, and David believed, and uh, 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 he was saved, not because they were circumcised, not because they participated in uh, uh, a Passover meal, but because of their faith. So that principle is the same. That's a covenant of faith. That's why Old Testament believers and New Testament believers, you know, their foundation is the same. What? Their foundation is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament people, they believe the Messiah who was to come and was saved. And New Testament people, they believe in Christ or Messiah who already came. And we know that he died and, and he came to life for me. Yeah, but Baptist position is this. You know, when you read particularly uh, uh, the gospels, then always what? The main thing is believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. And believe, then children can believe, no. So they cannot be included in the church members. They cannot be included as a covenant, uh, uh, a covenant member. That's why in Baptist churches, we, what? We dedicate our child, right? So we have a dedication ceremony instead to, to solve that problem. You know, you have your own baby, for example, and do you really consider your children as the ch uh, children of God's wrath? Because all unbelievers are under God's wrath and they're doomed to go to hell. Yeah, so Baptists have this kind of a, a difficulty. So what they uh, uh, developed was what? We, we dedicate our child to God. So we bring them up, you know, with the uh, biblical teaching. Okay. What about the uh, 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 pseudo-Baptist position? Like, you know, reform position is, of course, our children cannot uh, profess because they are just, you know, uh, a month old or, you know, uh, seven days old. Yeah, so instead of uh, uh, the children, the parents stand before God. And so I'm going to raise my children as God's family member, you know, according to uh, the principle. If you think this way, you know, if, if there was no uh, Genesis chapter 3, 4, then what? Then the external circumcision and the spiritual circumcision should be same, right? Because of uh, sin, entrance of sin, there became a discrepancy between what? External circumcision and internal circumcision. The same thing here in the uh, New Testament between, you know, a professor of their faith. But are they all truly born again? No, there are some, you know, people who are not born. Yeah, so we cannot know. Yeah, so how can you uh, treat those people? Yeah, we treat those people as if they were uh, 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 cast children. Why? Because they they confess with their you know uh, lips that they are a sinner and Jesus Christ died for their sin. But how can you know truly? How can you read their a uh, 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 mind? I cannot. And actually, many times, you know, the uh, people who profess 
They themselves do not know their heart very well. But only God knows. Yeah, so in both these cases, only God knows. Yeah, but, you know, the, the pseudo-baptist, for example, I was baptized when I was uh, one month old. And I cannot be baptized again because I was baptized. I became the member. That doesn't mean that you are 100% saved either. Yeah, so we have a, a like, what is it? Confirmation ceremony. We develop the confirmation ceremony. What does that mean? Confirmation uh, uh, ceremony means when the children grow up to the uh, accountable age, we, we usually call it about 13 years old, things like that, then they conform. It's the same as you know, uh, profess your uh, doctrine that you believe in Jesus and your, your, your sins are forgiven and you trust uh, Jesus 100%. That's like adults, you know, confessing their uh, belief. But we use confirmation because that person was already baptized when he or she was very young. Yeah, so this confirmation a ceremony, and in case of a Baptist, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, what is it, dedication ceremony? It's a, you know, pseudo-Baptist 100% cannot, you know, uh, support from the Bible. And Baptist position is lacking in some way, like dedication. You know, because uh, I am as a parent of my child, I can never consider my child as a, as a you know, uh, what? As, as a, like devil's children. That's why they dedicate. But they, do they know, the little children know that they are dedicated or not? The same thing as the one who were baptized here, you know? Yeah, so, okay, I'm not gonna take up too much time on it. Uh, because there are, you know, so many books regarding the difference between this. Yeah, so you may recall those. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Wayne Gruden book, he's a Baptist. Yeah, he's a reformed and he's a Baptist. So in that chapter, he supports the Baptist position and you read. And also he is a relatively very objective. Yeah, so he uh, write in detail the pseudo-Baptist position, you know, but not as much as I want, as satisfactory as I want it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, yeah, so again, my conclusion is, you know, I don't mind, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, a Baptist, and still you can you can remain as a reform. But as far as this a Baptist position concerned, you cannot be both a pseudo Baptist and Baptist because of this clear line. You know, we we make line here, but you make line here. Yeah. So, like I said, you know. Uh, in our theology, the weakness is co uh, covered by the name confirmation. And in your case, the, your weakness is covered by dedication of your children to God. Okay. Uh, did, I, did I answer your question a little bit? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, you know, we, we can spend 10 years still, yes. <laughs> not, not uh, uh, exhaust, you know, all these questions. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back to our... Hello, sir. Okay. All right. Saplo? Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. This this is I, you know, I used to um, uh, 
uh, encounter with uh, this kind of a question when I, I teach the students. Okay. There is a word, uh, the meaning of a baptism is, it is like outward expression of an inward change. So uh, it's kind of a inward change. You, you change inside first, and then you follow it by the outward expression that me follow it by the water baptism, something like that. Uh, uh, okay. So yeah, that is to say, uh, we must change in, inside first. After that, only we took a, we take a water baptism. So, uh, yeah, like in our current context, I don't know. Mostly, I see the they they took the outward expression first. Many mm -hmm. children, the inward change come later. Uh, okay. I feel it is not change in my opinion. We're yeah. talking about etymology. That is the uh, origin of a word. You know, for example, baptism, uh, uh, bapti baptisma. It, of course, it can, it means immersion, but it also have many different meanings. Okay. Yeah. So when you read books, uh, theological books, and all these arguments, then even some uh, 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 details, unless we are really uh, apt uh, in our understanding of uh, Greek and uh, uh, Hebrew and all this, you know, uh, I think deeply, then we are at a loss many times. Yeah, so I don't want, I'm not able to go deep in that, uh, but also I don't want us to uh, treat as if it is so clear, you know, that uh, water uh, means so clear, it's immersion. So, but you know, like uh, Robert Shaw says, have you ever thought about the uh, 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 in environment or the uh, uh, situation of time? You know, the, if you, there's not much water, you know, for example, in, uh, uh, X chapter, uh, uh, chapter three there, you know, 3,000 people, they were all baptized in that day. You think about that. Where this, all this, you know, uh, uh, water that you go immersed and come out, it is very unlikely, you know, you and your family, Yeah, so, you know, all this, uh, again, when you and me, we do theology, theology is the one that 100% everybody can understand. Ev everybody agree, then there's no uh, theology, you know, like liberal theology or, uh, uh, you know, conservative theology. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is a presupposition is very important. And you and me, we have to acknowledge we are presupposed. For example, I'm a you know, pseudo-Baptist. We don't call our, ourselves pseudo-Baptist, but you know, versus to Baptist, we call our pseudo-Baptist because we, we, we baptize infant. I'm presupposed. That means I'm a little bit prejudiced already because of my reform and covenant theology. I tend to see the whole Bible from that perspective. And Baptists same, you know, uh, they see everything from Baptist point of view. So as long as those things like including etymology and interpretation, and this is, you know, the, the, the theology is very fluid stuff, where you draw the line, whether you like it or not, we cannot uh, start from a vacuum. That means the moment we do something, we see something, then we already presuppose something. Yeah, so if you admit if you understand that and try to uh, go together as far as uh, uh, not major uh, theology, 
for example, you and me, we all agree whether you know a baby is uh, uh, infant baptized or adult baptized. Actually, most important thing is what? That's a regeneration by the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, unless the Holy Spirit really works in our heart and then revive our dead spirit, dead soul, then it doesn't mean whether you, you know, confess with your lips uh, at the age of 20 or at the age of 30. That's why the uh, uh, early church, the people, they put it off of baptism until the last moment before they die. Why? Because after baptism, if you sin again, then it become void, something like that. So they put it up until the last moment. Is it, is it a, a biblical? No, I don't think it is, but at least we have to understand they took it very seriously about baptism lot more seriously than we do now. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, you and me, I don't know why this baptism, you know, uh, the one thing I a little bit uh, uh, regret is, uh, you know, when people call you Baptist, as if it is, you know, when people call you Christian, that, uh, legitimate and that's good because you know Christian is what we confess that Christ is our Lord and Savior nothing can top it nothing is more important than that but the fact that you're Baptist or Pado Baptist or Presbyterian is that really important that important compared to other major doctrines they are not that is why you know denominational is not really uh, idea. But realistically, we have to acknowledge as long as you and me, we are simple human being, uh, you know, we are uh, depraved as long as we live with this body, then we have to realistically admit there are various ideas and opinions. And like I say, you know, about major doctrines like Trinity, like uh, uh, Jesus' uh, divinity and uh, humanity, like faith in Jesus, not by works, but by faith. All those kind of major doctrines, if you and me, you know, if we agree, then all these uh, uh, minor uh, difference, we can, agree to disagree, and still can go along harmoniously, no problem. Why we take this position? Look at our church history. You know, 1600, uh, later, okay. Now let's go to Low Supper. <laughs> you know, this is how, uh, how, not trivial, but how, foolish because of one little difference there's a Lutheran and reform split because of this law supper let's go into this all right applies the general principles of chapter 27 okay and does this within a specific form because it alternates between affirmation and abuse yeah alternatively they say this is a positive statement and two is a, a negative statement this way, all right? First, institution. Our Lord Jesus in the night wherein he was betrayed instituted the sacrament of body and blood called the Lord's Supper to be observed in his church unto the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of himself in his death and sealing all benefits thereof unto true believers, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him. Therefore, the engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto him and to be a bond 
and a pledge of their communion with him and with each other as members of his mystical body. The Lord's Supper is to be given in the church because given to Christ's people, constituted in union with him. It is to be observed perpetually until it comes. It serves as a remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. Notice that they move immediately from remembrance to a larger concept that in the supper, there is the sealing of the benefits of Christ's sacrifice to believers, the nourishment to and engagement of believers, and the sense which believers have of their union in communion with Christ and of their communion with each other. We already cover in the you know, communion of saints, all right? Uh, as members of Christ's body. Here, in a way, then maybe is even broader than what they say about baptism. The underlying dynamic of what they're saying is that if it is true that baptism is a symbol of Christ and his work for us and what it means to be united to him and similarly with the Lord's Supper, then the significance of both of these rites opens up onto the whole of the gospel. And there is very rich symbolism in the supper, right? Section two, in this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his father, nor any real sacrifice made at all for remission of sins of the quick or bad, but only a commemoration of that one offering of, of himself, by himself upon the cross once for all and a spiritual oblation of all possible praise unto God for the same, so that the Pope is sacrifice of the mass, you know the mass, right? Uh, as they call it, is most abominably injurious to Christ one only sacrifice, the alone of a propitiation for all the sins of his elect. In light of selection, uh, section one, denies the teaching of the mass. There is no sacrifice in Lord's Supper, at least in Roman sense. We don't offer up Christ to the, the Father. Rather, I guess in my opinion, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the decline uh, of Roman Catholic Church, the main cause, the main reason is the mass. We'll see why, okay? Because, you know, for them, the mass is most important. If you're a Catholic believer, all you have to do is to attend mass. Then there is automatic, you receive God's grace. We do not offer Christ to the Father. Rather, the movement is totally different. Christ offers himself for us. This is a great distinction. So the supper is not an atoning sacrifice, but points us rather to one's oral sacrifice. When we participate in Lord's Supper, we uh, uh, remember Christ's death and resurrection, and we participate in spirit in his death and resurrection. That is what communion with Jesus Christ and communion with each other. The only sacrifice that is being offered is our sacrifice of praise, which arises in believers' heart in response. Section three, the man of celebration, the Lord Jesus has in this ordinance appointed his ministers to declare his word of institution to the people, to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine and thereby to set them apart from a common to holy use and to take and break the bread, to take the cup and they communicating also themselves to give both to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. Note the connection with ministers of the gospel, 
and this section on the proper administration of the supper. Note the counsel at the end of a three. It is not to be reserved for someone not present. And I'm sorry, note the codicil at the end of three. It is not to be reserved for someone not present right here, okay? Who are not then present in the congregation. You're not supposed to give, but they do, the Roman Catholic Church. For later use, they reserve, you know, the uh, bread. This contrast to the Catholic view that since it remains objectively the body of Christ, you can keep it and use it up later. In contrast, the divines, the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper is not located in the bread and wine, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, making Christ present in the action and even of the supper. It is by means of the bread and wine, not by being located within the bread and wine, that Lord Jesus communes with his people and communicates himself to them. In the mass, you know what? Jesus Christ died again and again and again, like he died 2,000 years ago. Exactly the same thing. How idolatrous it is. And so the notion of the reservation and preservation of the sacraments, so it might be given to others who are not present is a basic repudiation of what is central to the Lord's Supper, that Christ is present in the dynamic of the supper rather than locked in the bread and wine. Here, from you know, section four, various abuses. Now, what went wrong with the mass? Private masses or receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other alone as likewise, the denial of the cup to the people. And you should know they only participate in the bread, sharing the bread, not cup. Later on, we'll see, you know, the denial of cup to the people, worshiping the elements, the lifting, uh, lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and the reserving them or any pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of Christ. Uh, this is a private masses or receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other loan, contrary to the nature of this sacrament and to the institution of Christ. Why are private masses forbidden? because the mass itself is injurious to the gospel. Receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other, even a lawfully ordained minister of gospel is contrary to the meaning of Lord's Supper for later use, for example, why? Because the meaning of the Lord's Supper is related not only to me and my individual fellowship with Jesus Christ, but related to me as a member of the body of Christ since at the end of section one, it is a bond and pledge of our union and communion of, with uh, Christ and with each other. The Lord's Supper is not to be administered or received privately, but they do privately. When they sick people cannot attend, then the priest go to the hospital or to the house and administer this sacrament privately. No, it is a public administration. Third, the denier of the cup is contrary to the nature of sacrament. Why they deny the cup? Why they only allow uh, the bread? Then a repudiation of any adoration of the elements or reservation of the elements, both of which are rooted in view that the bread wine become the body and blood of Christ, so that while the accidents remain that of bread and wine, it really is the body and blood of Christ, and therefore become an object 
towards which adoration of appropriate. Have you ever heard a story about uh, what is it? Our king is naked. You know, uh, there was a king and who was deceived by con man, you know, who received a lot of money from the king and then clothed him with invisible, invisible clothes, right? And wow, do you see these clothes? You know, if you have a bad heart at that, you know, bad person, then you cannot, uh, you cannot see this. Yeah, so this, you know, a, a king was, became naked and thinking that he was adorned with this invisible uh, a clothes. And then he make a tour and a lot of people, you know, his subject, they all bow. And inside, they, they all laugh. And all of a sudden, a little child, you know, and stood up and, look, the king is naked. <laughs> Have you ever uh, heard the story? Okay, it's the same. What it's, in essence, it says, when a priest, you know, he holds the uh, 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 bread, and then speak in uh, Latin something, this is my body, you know, and do in remembrance of all me, you know, in, in the Bible. Then what? At that moment, with the saying of Latin from the mouth of the priest, it changes. Actually, the quality, the substance changes into what? the body of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so even though we see with our own physical eyes the bread, but we have to think, we have to believe that is what? Truly the body of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is truly body of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible said, this is my body. Yeah, so they completely ignore a symbolism. And then they, they do not share the priest, you know, drink the cup by himself and do not share this. Why? Because this is the blood of Jesus Christ. If somehow the lay people, you know, spill, uh, uh, spill the wine, then it is shed. You know, they, they spill the precious blood of Jesus Christ and make it, you know, a, a shame. That's why they forbid the lay people's taking part of uh, the Lord's cup. How ridiculous, how superstitious, you know. But if it has become their a tradition and everything and by law ordinance, then it becomes. That's why so many majority of uh, 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 Catholics, they do not know the Bible. Why? Because uh, for them, the faith is an implicit faith. That is what? Whatever priest says, I will agree. Then you don't have to know the content of what the priest say, because you agree with what he says in Latin or what? That's why they're so ignorant in general about the Bible. That is why, particularly in uh, Latin America, you know, the last uh, 60 years, 70 years, when Pentecostal movement really uh, swung a full swing in Latin America, nowadays, you know, 20%, 30% in Brazil, Argentina, you know, all these countries, because of this Pentecostal movement, they all, many, many uh, nominal uh, Catholic became Christian, thank God, you know? So they become, they uh, abandon this, uh, that's not even, you know, in uh, Latin America in general, the Catholics is not really uh, uh, not Catholic of European countries because in the first place, the Catholic was not really a, 
a, a Catholic there. Catholic uh, was what? Uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, I forgot how to say that. You know, mixing together. That is mm. a syncretism. See? They, the, the Catholic teaching was mixed with the original, you know, the native uh, shamanistic uh, religions of South American Indians. And they never extracted, they could never heard the pure gospel in the beginning. That's why when you see, you know, the carnival, in Brazil and you know Argentina, all those that's a religious uh, uh, ceremonies for three days, four days. What they do, they indulge in all kind of uh, uh, sexual scenes and drunkards and all those things happen there. You know, so many people died, the gangsters. That is the Christian ceremonies. How? Uh, uh, delinquent, how uh, corrupted the gospel of Jesus has become in South America, or many in African countries also. You know, the, not only Catholic, but Protestant, but you know, most miserable countries, uh, backward countries like uh, Nigeria or uh, 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 Central Congo, you know, those are all Christian countries. But all this vicious crime uh, uh, are done there, uns unspeakable uh, uh, crimes and sins there in the name of Jesus Christ. How deplorable, how unspeakable. Yeah, so it is utterly important for us to really stand before God, you know? Uh, because gospel, nothing can top gospel. Gospel is a second to none. Gospel is qualitatively completely different from all these human inventions. And only if you and me, we enjoy the gospel, we can transform not only ourselves, but the whole world. But alas, look at this. <laughs> Okay, let me go and otherwise it's already only 10 minutes left. I don't think we can finish today. Uh, section five, the outward elements in this sacrament duly set apart to the uses ordained by Christ have such relation to him crucified as that truly, yet sacramentally only, they are sometimes called by the name of the things they represent to wit the body, and blood of Christ, albeit, that means although, in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine as they were before. This is against the Roman Catholic teaching of you know, transubstantiation. Trans means uh, change, you know? Substantiation, the substance changes. Yeah, so bread becomes the body and uh, 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 the wine becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. And you got to believe like the king, you know, who was deceived. <laughs> okay, in the light of rejection of the above uses, this section explains the meaning of the sacramental union uh, principle when it's applied to the Lord's Supper. Section six. A tax, yeah, it attacks a transubstantiation and its consequences. That doctrine, which maintains a change of the substance of bread and wine into the substance of Christ's body and blood, commonly called transubstantiation, by consecration of a priest or by any other way, is repugnant, not to scripture alone, but even to common sense and reason overthrows the nature of sacrament, has been and is the cause of many false superstitions, yeah, of gross idolatries. I have already shared with you. Section seven, worthy receivers, 
outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this sacrament, do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and uh, corporally, but spiritually. Yeah, not carnally and corporally against uh, Roman Catholic, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all benefits of his death. The body and blood of Christ being then not corporally, not carnally, in, with, or under the bread of wine. This is against a Lutheran church again. You know, Lutheran church teaches that they call consubstantiation, con means together, right? With, that means because Jesus said, this is my body. Yeah, so the, the, the bread and the wine do not change. But when priest or pastor say this, that Jesus' body and Jesus' blood is with the bread, with the wine, in, uh, in the wine, and under the wine. Together, con, that's a con, substantiation. This one we do not believe, okay? Describes the nature of fellowship, which we enjoy with Christ in the sacrament. Here we see what is common in Reformed theology, the notion that just as the proclamation of the word by the minister of the gospel, we hear Christ speaking to us through the proclamation of the gospel. So in the visible sacraments of the Lord's Supper, Christ communicates to us by these physical vis visible means, which are expressions of this a death and res a sacrifice. And we thus enter uh, into fellowship with Christ, not corporally, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what? Right after Reformation, these Lutheran uh, theologians and Reformed theologians got together, you know, like Luther and Zwingli from Reformed Soccer, and they talk about, and most of the uh, major doctrines they agree. But now, finally, they came up, they came up to this issue of uh, a Lord's Supper. And Martin Luther kept insisting. He said that, look, the Bible said, this is my body. This is my blood. So we got to believe. And Zwingli did not agree with him. He said, no, no, this is, a, you know, we remember his death and resurrection. It is not there. Just it's a symbolism. And uh, all of a sudden, a Luther just rose and went out. And from there, <laughs> the division of two of Protestants so became one, you know, the Lutheran and the other uh, a reform. Look at this, how trivial a thing from which they split. And a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, just a funny story, but a lot of uh, 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 a church historian said, you know, at that time, Luther was a doctor, right? He has PhD, right? And Zwingli, he didn't have that. So Luther, in his thought, no, I cannot side with that, you know, uneducated person, <laughs> you know, that uh, our gathering was a uh, uh, split. That's just the same, but uh, how fallible again, and how corruptible, uh, a corruptible we can be, you know, always we have to uh, 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 carefully, you know, look into ourselves, see if our deep motive is what? Most likely for myself glorification instead of, a, you know, a, a glorification of Jesus Christ. The more we come to know our depraved mind, then the more we acknowledge the fact that you are what you are, I am what I am, 
only purely by 100% by God's grace. All right? Okay, uh, finally, section eight, we unworthy participation. Although ignorant and wicked men receive the outward elements in this sacrament, yet they receive not the things signified thereby, but by their unworthy coming on thereunto, a guilty of the body and blood of the Lord to their own damnation. Wherefore, all ignorant and ungodly persons, as they are unfit to enjoy communion with him, so are they unworthy of the Lord's table and cannot without grace sin against Christ while they remain such partake of these holy mysteries or to be admitted thereunto. Yeah, so before you do, you know, uh, 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 this ceremony, you solemnly uh, warn church members, if you're engaged in sin currently, then do not participate in, you know, a low supper, because it is actually harmful for your spiritual uh, uh, a growth, okay? That double notion at the end is imposing upon the individual the responsibility to withdraw and open the church, the obligation not to admit to the Lord's table those who are set in contrast by a profession of lifestyle against the inner significance of the Lord's table. Yeah, we are almost uh, uh, up. So, yeah, next week, uh, we'll begin from chapter 30 of Church Ascensors because the last one, the uh, uh, eschatology is very brief uh, in uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, I'm going to take any question you have that we share here. Any question up to this point? No, okay, uh, then uh, let me see who are present at this moment. Uh, Oné, Oné, are you there? Oné, Oné, Saplo. Yes, yeah, sir, I'm okay. here. Okay, would you like to uh, pray for us? Okay, let's pray. Sure, sure. sure. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you have done in our life. And especially thank you for the class that you be with us and thank you for your protection and thank you for sustaining us with your love your mercy your care and most importantly thank you for your blessing upon each and every one of us thank you for the opportunity where we can gather together in zoom and learn from one another and equip ourselves in every good work so that we uh, uh, were able to uh, gain more knowledge and share in our ministry. So thank you for this opportunity. And especially we pray and we thank you for the life of our profession who has been a, a channel of a blessing for the current people, for the other people. Thank you for the life that you have given to him as he is a continue serving you, Lord, uh, this is our humble prayer that may you continue strengthen him, uh, bless him, empower him in your ministry, and continue use him in your ministry mightily, Lord. And I pray for the family and those who, uh, anyone who belong to him, Lord, bless them, Lord, and uh, take care of them, Lord. And also pray for uh, all the students, all our brothers and sisters 
who are participate in this Zoom class. Uh, this is our prayer that may you bless each and every one of us, uh, each and every one of our family, Lord, uh, provide, uh, pray for the, your pro provision in our daily life and uh, pray for uh, good health, pray for the good living, Lord, uh, will be a point in every one of us. Thank you for this time. We thank you everything in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you for keeping with us. Thank you. Thank you, right. sir. God bless you, and we'll see you next Amen. week. And the see last you. week, we're going to summarize everything we have done, all right? And then take your questions. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. God be with you. See you next week. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, too.